now I would love to introduce our first session to the stage. We have Gina McCarthy, former U.S. National Climate Advisor and EPA Administrator and Managing Co-Chair of the America's All-In Coalition, and Becky Ferguson, CEO of the Salesforce Foundation and Senior Vice President of Phil Philanthropy for Salesforce. Those are two long titles. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, you both deserve it, though. <laughs> Have we run out of time? <laughs> <Right. laughs> um, thank you both so much for joining me. So we're obviously here to talk a little bit about partnerships. You both have unique experiences in both. Gina, let's start with you. I know you have, I mean, what have you not done, I guess, in your career at this point? Everything. Um, can you just share a little bit about some of the different types of ways you've seen partnership work across public-private sector, everything that you've, everything that you've experienced? Well, first of all, um, I'm glad we're talking about partnerships because I think we need to really move. And the only way we're going to do that is we work, if we work together. And so I've seen some extraordinary opportunities for public and private partnerships. Some of them are explicitly stated that way. Others just grow into that. And I think uh, I see both in the U.S., I think the Inflation Reduction Act was a public-private partnership. Right. It basically is giving some resources to attract a lot more private sector dollars, and it's working. But I also see this internationally, and, and one of the most important things, I think, for us to remember is the obligation that we owe to the Global South and how we can start being much better and smarter about how to build those kind of public-private partnerships to actually invest in the Global South that desperately needs it. I think sometimes we forget that climate change is a global problem. We won't fix it unless every country has an opportunity to build in a way that's going to keep them healthy and safe and prosperous. So that's what these partnerships are all about. And it, there's enormous opportunities here. Could you share a little bit, Becky, about what all the work you're doing at Salesforce and Salesforce Foundation? Sure. Well, first, it's great to be here, share a meal with this collective group and uh, be in conversation with, with Gina. And yes, yeah, so Salesforce, it's interesting that we're celebrating our 25th year anniversary this year. And it's, um, I think, from the get-go, our founders had um, a mission of really, like, how do we create a new business model, but also how do we create a new model of giving back? And from the early days, we, you know, we had some people, we had some product, we had some equity, and it really kind of birthed what we think of as our 111 model. And um, over the years, we have been really a values-based company, and sustainability is one of our five core values. As a company, it comes to life in a lot of different ways across our business, including including in our philanthropy um, with our uh, ecosystem and climate justice a restoration fund, but uh, also through our ventures portfolio, a lot of different ways that our climate work com comes to life. A quick follow-up question on that. Where do you feel like that leadership and setting those commitments really came from internally? Well, I think it's both a top-down and a bottom-up, um, right? It's been a part of our company from the early days in the DNA, but it's also, I think, within what starts to attract people to the company as well. I think more and more people want to feel that they are a part of a values-based company. So I think it's a, yeah, it's a become more of a pull factor. So then you start to have the, this uh, both top-down, bottom-up. Um, so I think it's really been a combination of the two. Gina, back to you. Right now, I know you are, as I said, you're co-chair of America's All In. Could you share a little bit more with the group about what America's All In for those who, I guess, raise, raising of hands, anybody who knows what America's All In is at this point? Okay, we've got a good, a little bit, but we've got a lot of newbies, so yeah. can you share a little bit about what it is? <laughs> well, America is All In is a uh, probably one of the largest groups of human beings that have gathered together with real authority to, to tackle the climate crisis across the U.S. And Bloomberg has pulled this together. It's mayors and governors, industry leaders, philanthropies. I mean, you name it, folks are engaged. It's now uh, well over 5,000. And so we're excited about it because it's an opportunity to do a couple of things. One is to recognize the, the challenges that are out there, but also the opportunities that exist. Look, I firmly believe that we have everything we need, every technology, product, process, that we need to tackle the climate crisis. 
So what we need is leadership, right? This is building leadership across corporate America, across governments, to actually continue to move forward, regardless of what the federal government says, we're gonna be out there acting. So we are all uh, about going to different mayors in different cities and governors, and we bring teams of technical people so they can learn how to access the Inflation Reduction Act money. Money's great, but not if you can't figure out how to use it mm -hmm. and grab it. And so we're, we're starting at square one to recognize that there's tremendous opportunity, but also enthusiasm and excitement right now. We have to build on that, and we have to make sure that we turn that excitement into action. That's what America is all in, because frankly, if America is not all in, we're not going to win. Yes. Hands to that, yeah. So um, one follow-up question on America's All In. Given the political, we have an election coming up. You talked a little bit about that IRA and how important that has been for partnerships and for you know, getting the money that you need. Do you feel like there is a way for us to protect all of that if there is a change in, in what happens in uh, the election this year? Maybe it's, uh, the answer is, um, it depends on the change. Um, yeah, there, uh, there is, I mean, we've been through challenges before. Um, I think one of the good news things about the Inflation Reduction Act is that it's, it basically has provided um, a, around $370 billion in private sector investment has come in, um, and we see uh, that money actually the vast majority of it is going to Republican districts. So I think there's a lot of interest in making sure that people aren't going around and shooting themselves in the foot. So I think because it's been so successful, it's a lot of money and it's impacting constituencies in Republican and Democratic districts that there's, there's a really good opportunity for us to maintain the, the momentum. Now, will, will it mean no change if, if there's a change in administration? Absolutely not. Um, we, we'll have to keep fighting. But frankly, that's exactly how uh, America is all in grew up. It's to right, make exactly. sure, like we did the last time, we keep fighting together at the subnational level. Because when the federal government doesn't do its job, that's the backstop for everything else. And, and it's there, and it's going to continue to be there because we've grown it, and we're going to keep growing it more. Yeah, amazing. Becky, over to you, a little bit shifting gears. So talking more about partnerships, um, could you share a little bit more about the Mangroves uh, project and how kind of you've used partnerships on, on that? Yeah, definitely. I'd love to talk about that. Um, mangroves are one of our you know, amazing climate champions out there, right? These blue forests uh, not only provide... Uh, food, shelter, and livelihoods. They help support biodiversity. They help build coastal resilience, and they're one of the most um, productive carbon sinks out there. And so, you know, when it comes down to it, mangroves are really important for climate, for nature, for people and communities. And while vast um, um, amounts of mangroves have been lost over the last half century, the tides are starting to turn, and there really is an opportunity to um, for restoration of our mangroves. And uh, we really, I think it comes down to both, Gina, to your point, that not only capital, but coordination around that capital. It's estimated it would take $4 billion to secure the future of 15 million hectares of mangroves globally, which is an ambitious target, but it's also one that's not within reach. And the mangrove breakthrough is an example of a partnership, one that brings together companies, um, co communities, NGOs, uh, and countries, really think about how can we halt the loss of mangroves, but how can we also protect and sustainably manage those that we have left? And then how do you unlock capital to scale, you know, to your point, the things we know that work and mobilize like real action on the ground. So I think it's a, one of those strong examples that brings together multiple govern, government signatories, um, leadership from some of the most credible organizations sort of setting aside their individual goals in pursuit of a common interest, a common goal, <laughs> the UN, but also companies, uh, foundations, financial institutions putting money behind things, and also really diverse representation of voices from different 
populations, uh, indigenous communities. And so, yeah, it's one of those examples, I think, of a, of a partnership where you can kind of see the potential for really planetary scale impact to protect and preserve one of our most critical ecosystems. How do you identify the right types of partners if somebody is trying to figure out, you know, how do I find other organizations to help me with my climate goals? How do you identify those? Let's, you want to start with you, Becky. Yeah. Um, I think it's probably an art more than a <laughs> science. Um, but, right, when it comes down to it, you need great people to get big things done. I think people who do a lot of work in collective impact or systems change will say, you know, in order to change a system, you need to get the system in the room together. So I think a lot of it is really about how do you bring diverse voices and perspectives around a table together, you know, your scientists, but also your storytellers and really being thoughtful about who's around the table, what voices around the table, but also who might be, might be missing. Gina? You know, one of the things I, th I think about when you try to figure out who your partners are is that, is that one of the things I always try to do is re remind people that the concept of climate change and greenhouse gases is not something that everybody can easily digest and, and also get excited about because they feel like it's so big, what can anybody do? So I think it's hugely important when you're building partnerships to speak in language that people can relate to. You know, I don't go out and talk about greenhouse gas emissions. I talk about air quality. I talk about how many children die every day because our air quality is awful, and we know where that's coming from. And climate and health are entirely related and need to be addressed that way. And we talk about money savings. You know, people don't need to be asked to sacrifice anymore. We don't need sacrifice. What we need is investment. And so if we can do this right, we're going to save people money. That matters. And I'm not saying there's, there's any, you know, there's just nothing wrong with going to communities and making sure that they understand the benefits of what you're trying to do. So while we may be trying to save the planet, they're trying to put food on their table. So let's get real about that and make sure that everybody knows why you're doing it and the benefits that matter to our families and our communities. That's when we will win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> A follow-up question to that. I, do, I think we all probably feel that are all of us working in climate that a lot of times it's this uphill battle to exactly what you said. People just get overwhelmed. They feel like the problem's too big. What can I do? So I'm not going to deal with it at all. I'm not going to think about it. How do you, what do you do to combat that? Start with you, Gina. Oh, okay. Um, I, like I said, I think you, you need to reach people where they are. But, I, you know, I, I'm not sure that's as big a problem as it used to be. I think the problem now is to get money where it's needed. <laughs> Good. Yeah. We made progress. Here, here, that makes me uh, happy to hear. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I really think that, and it's and it's exciting to see the opportunities. Mm -hmm. now. Yeah, I mean, we do have we've put this festival together, and look at all the people that have come. You know, we wouldn't have seen that five years ago. So, yeah, yeah. Becky, anything you would add to that too? Mm, I think maybe also the power in in stories, and mm -hmm. I think Gina, to your point, the speaking in plain language and uh, sort of stripping away the, the jargon, I think so, sometimes one of the most powerful ways that can come to life is through, through stories and through storytelling and through different voices of stories. And I think that can be really uplifting and a way peop for people to relate yeah. to, to things. Yeah. yeah, that's a great point too. Okay, so we've talked about identifying partners and how do you find them. Um, how do you measure the success once you have started one? And we'll do that back to you, Becky. Well, I, I think some of the most um, impactful or powerful partnerships have, I've seen have had very clear and ambitious goals, a, a timeline with them. But um, I also think that sometimes the success of partnerships is just the process itself is the solution. Um, so yes, a big ambitious goal, one that would be bigger than anyone to do on their own can be really motivating, but also recognizing, yeah, the, the sometimes with partnerships, the magic is just in the process of being in partnership 
together. And um, yeah, and then I think also just like sticking in the game long enough yeah. to see yeah. change, especially through, you know, the ups and downs of partnerships. There can be a lot of energy at the beginning and then, you know, things can kind of slow and pick back up. And that's, I think we're having a really ambitious North Star can can keep the motivation up, but also knowing, yeah, behind the scenes, the, the process itself is, is really powerful and sometimes harder to measure because like when it really comes down to it, partnerships are so much about people and relationships. So the strength of those relationships, those ties and those networks, I think is also a real, um, an indicator of the success that partnerships can have. Gina, follow up question that you can add to, but I was just gonna say um, how, how do you really maintain those partnerships? Like what do you do to keep those relationships going? I think, I think it's, it's honest dialogue about what's working and what isn't. You know, I think we have to recognize as human beings that you fail sometimes. And other times you do something and everybody starts going, so how'd they do that? And that's when you have to be clear about how'd you do that? <laughs> you know, I feel like this is not a, a time when we want to focus on ourselves as much as we want to focus on our opportunity for humanity. You know, this is an existential challenge, and it, and it demands quite honest dialogue about what's worked, what hasn't, what's likely to, 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 to be built on. And so I think that's the important part, is to not hide when you've had a failure, um, and not to think that that's going to be permanent, yeah. but to really just keep plugging along, but make the success visible to everybody. It's, it's about hope, right? You know, if we all just sit around being depressed, we're gonna be sitting here forever saying the same damn thing. So we've gotta get excited and see these opportunities for what they are. I would love to take a couple of audience questions now. Um, does, anybody, does anybody have any questions? Oh, got one over there. Hello, my name is Adam. I work uh, with Climate Solutions here in town in, in Oregon on a fleet decarbonization accelerator, and we work with a lot of partners. Uh, and I have found that the warm leads, the warm leads, make it so much easier to grow those partnerships. And I would love to hear from you all how you do your partnership growth, maybe for folks that are a little more resource confined than Salesforce is per se, uh, and and how you best go about um, kind of building those relationships and building those bridges. Start with you, Becky. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, um, well, one thing I think a lot about with, with partnerships is, is also just sort of what each partner can bring to the, the table. And right, in partnerships that we're a part of, oftentimes it's really simple things like helping to make an introduction for a, an organization or we, you know, when you're, we do a lot of events ourselves, right, inviting our partners to have a presence in those events. Um, just sort of looking at all of the sort of kind of they might seem like small acts, but like really powerful, I think, sort of seeds or ripples. And um, yeah, we'll call you sort of, you know, like always pick up the phone, take that call. Um, and, you know, you, it might not be like I can do this exactly, but I might know someone else in my network that can help uh, with that and be sort of working the ties and connections that we have with, with one another. Can, can I just get, take a second to give a shout out to Climate Solutions? Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're, they're just, they're so, so awesome. But also to give a shout out to Governor Inslee um, because he's nearing the end of his term and you folks, anyone who is in this state needs to recognize that there are bills that are trying to undermine that progress and please, make sure you get active in protecting the progress that's been made in this state. It is groundbreaking and do not let any single big person who spent a ton of money who's trying to defeat this win. Please. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. Go, uh, it's, Gina, needed, it's why, we, it's why we love you. It's a great role model. Like, well, and it's a nice plug because we have Governor Inslee at two o'clock, so Yay. stay tuned. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> uh, another qu any other questions from the audience? We can probably take one more over there. Making you run, Sam, sorry. 
the food is coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, Paul Bergen. Um, I work with Exit Ventures. We're a climate stage or climate tech uh, venture capital. Uh, we specialize in helping corporations partner with startups in order to accelerate the commercialization and the global commercialization of these critical technologies so that we can get this tech out into the marketplace faster. Um, I'm curious, what best practices have you seen in terms of accelerating progress through technology? Uh, what models have you seen that work the best? And uh, what gets you excited about how we're actually commercializing real advancements in technology that are making a difference? Thanks. Should have had you muttering up here. You got, you got, <laughs> you've got some great questions. All right, Becky, you want to start with that one? Well, one thing I would say has been sort of, um, it's been exciting and interesting for us too is uh, we just do a, uh, spend a lot of time looking at our capital stack as a company. So right, we think about our philanthropic dollars, what role they could play alongside our venture portfolio, maybe sustainability or green bonds. So we do a lot of work as a company to kind of look at what is our capital stack, what role can different forms of capital best play? We put out a, a piece of work actually last year on a corporate climate finance playbook, um, sort of kind of bring together some of our lessons on that. But for us, it's really been how do you how do you look at that spectrum of capital and the different roles it can play to help um, both seed test new ideas, but also get them out into scale into market. Anything you want to add on that one? I don't no. think so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, other than to say, I think it's a really great idea for corporations to start looking at these types of partnerships, but it's challenging. You know, and, and I know that, that I'm doing a lot of work now with a few investment companies, and it's challenging because uh, uh, I think, you know, the carbon credit market needs to be legitimate, it needs to grow. There are ways in which we need to look at the financial viability of the investments that we're making. And if we don't think more creatively and start investing well, we're not going to win. And so I think it's really exciting. I've spent a lot of time with, with chief sustainability officers who are struggling with the dynamics of today. Let's get over those dynamics and really just start acting together. One final question to end on. Um, what keeps you both motivated to continue doing this work? Gina, start with you. Five grandchildren. Yeah. That's what motivates me. That's what I'm working for every single day. It's uh -huh. their future that we have to hand to them, and I ain't going to be the one to lose it. <laughs> yeah. Becky? Um, yeah, I think uh, there's, there's just a lot of wonderful, beautiful things happening, and I think just taking – Moments to appreciate those small wins, um, and then also uh, just a little bit of levity and humor, I feel like also helps me power through tough moments. Well, you two and Gina, you keep me motivated because you, you always show me we can all do it. So. You too, <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you both so much for your time. Thanks, Thank everybody. you. Thank you.